Hello, everyone. This is the 63rd episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I'm joined by Paul from Shipland, England. Unfortunately, due to unforeseen technical difficulties, Paul will not be joining us today, and it will just be myself. For this episode, we interview the Belgium national team's media and press officer, as well as author, Mr. Stefan Van Luk. As we discuss the matches of the Belgium national team during the 1982 World Cup. In addition to his role as Belgium's men's and women's media and press officer, Mr. Van Luke has authored books on football history, such as 100 Years of Royal Sporting Club Anderlecht, Return to Montevideo in the wake of John Langenus and the Belgian Red Devils to the first World Cup in 1930, and 1895, 125 years of emotional heritage. Mr. Von Luke has also worked as a television commentator for the 1990, 1994, and 2000 World Cup, as well as Champion League's matches. Hello, Mr. Von Luke. Hello, just, Sean. Can you just introduce yourself and tell us about your early football memories and history with the game? Well, I'm Stefan Van Luke, as you mentioned already before. I'm 61 years old, which is uh, nearly retired age. I'm a football fan since uh, my childhood. Uh, now I'm working uh, in the second period now for the Belgian um, national men's team and also for the national women's team. Before that, I, just, I was commentating for a private uh, bro- um, commercial channel and, and after that for a, a pay TV channel. I also did some cycling as a, as a reporter. I went a few times to the Tour de France, but my main sport is football and that dates from my early ages, let's say, when I was uh, a child and European Cup football was on the television on Wednesday evenings, it was still in black and white. It was the evening I had to go for swimming lessons in, in, in Brussels, took, had to take a bus uh, to Brussels, came back when the games were still on in black and white. It was more, merely Celtic against Real Madrid, Benfica against Manchester United, those, uh, those matches with, uh, with poor pictures, uh, but great atmosphere and great matches. It started since then, and then um, here's how it goes. A, a young child or a young boy asks his dad to go and see a football game because my dad was not that a football fanatic. It, it took a while. In the end, we went to a game. It was a fantastic game in, in the Antwerp area. Berchem Sport, who is now playing in the lower leagues against Lies, who are now in second division. And the game ended in a 3 all draw. It was the first floodlighted match in that stadium. It was April 1973. It was a fantastic game, three all the score. And I was sold to football and football became my life and uh, my life became football. Belgium at international level had stagnated in the 1970s, overshadowed by their Dutch neighbors who eliminated them from the 1974 and the 1978 World Cups. The Dutch also defeated Belgium 5-0 in the 1976 Euro quarterfinals and this defeat led to the end of the Raymond Gothals era and the arrival of Guy Thies. It would take a few years for Thies to rebuild the side, but the progress was evident and noticeable as they reached the final of the 1980 Euros, losing to West Germany. Thies was successful in implementing 442 tactics revolving around the offside trap in defense consisting of the eccentric goalkeeper Jean-Marie Pfaff and the standard Liège duo of Eric Gerrits, Walter Muse, and also Michel Rankin. Belgium had advanced to the 1982 World Cup, winning a difficult group containing France, Holland, and the Republic of Ireland. What are your thoughts on their evolution in these previous few years? Well, uh, there has been a changing of the guards that has been taking place between uh, Guy Thijs and Raymond Houtal. So when Raymond Houtal uh, left the job halfway through 76, we didn't give a penny anymore to qualify for the World Cup 1978. Belgium was uh, in, in, in a low. It was in, in, uh, after uh, the seven, early 70s where we were in the Euros that was organized in our own country, but it was a final tournament with only four teams, with only four nations. And we, uh, 
we became third. We had bronze medal against uh, Hungary. But then uh, Gutas was uh, was uh, the man who, who put Belgium internationally more and more on the football map because the Dutch never had it easy with us, although they once beat us 5-0. Still, uh, Raymond Gutas was a very tactical, skilled coach, uh, playing quite defensively, uh, had a very tough and, and quite a talented team, but didn't get uh, the maximum out of it. And in those days, yeah, Belgium wasn't that professional as, as it is now. Then Guy Thijs came halfway through 1976. He, he would work on a long-term project. As I told you, the Belgian FA was not very um, strong in thinking that it would reach the 1978 World Cup. So, yes, Belgium was then eliminated for the third time in succession to participate in a big tournament. So we were eliminated, as you said, for the World Cup in 74 in Germany by Holland. We were eliminated for the Euros in 76 in Yugoslavia. And we were then uh, not qualified for the World Cup 78 in Argentina. So three big tournaments in a row, we were not there. So the aim was the next big thing should be not the World Cup 78, but the Euros in uh, 1980. And that was uh, was a very success, as you mentioned. We get uh, we got the silver medal in in the final against Germany. That even we we could have won with a little uh, more luck. But um, yes, Gitaes made a, a good team out of it. And then after the um, well, after the the draw, we 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 had to face a few nations to qualify for uh, the Euros 1980. And the first game was Norway, and we didn't come further than a draw against Norway, so that was quite humiliating. And then we beat, um, we drew in Portugal and in Austria, and then we got on more and more, and so then we we, we were able to, to qualify for the for the 1980 Euros in Italy with the success that that uh, is known by most football followers and, and that we were able to to take the, the silver medal in a, after a fantastic final and a fantastic tournament in, in a Euros that was in those days not as it is now, Stadiums in Italy, when Italy was not playing, were not even half full. We played in San Siro for fifteen thousand people against against uh, England or in uh, against uh, Spain. So um, that was not what it is now. Uh, there had been um, also troubles with negotiating the extra bonuses for the players. So it started under a re- under rather a bad atmosphere. But in the end, once the players got on the pitch, they fought for each other. And uh, there we, we, we went on very well and, and had, a, had a great result there. And this carried into the World Cup qualifiers and with more confidence, Belgium would qualify for the World Cup in a tough group. Well, yeah, we had, we had a strong group to qualify, as, as, as you mentioned. To qualify for, for the 1982 World Cup, we had, as you said, we had to beat uh, Holland, Republic of Ireland and France. That was not a not an easy one, but um, people were hoping that after the silver medal in '80, we were hoping that that we could qualify for the '82 World Cup as as we did. We that would be the first time in in 12 years because the last World Cup was in 1970. So in those in those years, early 80s, late 70s, Belgian club football was really on a high, was flourishing with several European finals in which Belgian clubs uh, were involved, 1976, and the like one against West Ham United in Brussels, the final of the uh, Cup, Winners' Cup. Then uh, in 77, they lost against Hamburg. 78, they beat Austria, Vienna in Paris. Also, Bruges and Standard played European finals. Bruges twice against Liverpool, once in the UEFA Cup, 76. And then in the in the Champions Cup in um, 1978, Standard Liège, the third big team in Belgium, on paper at least for the moment, they got beaten in, in Barcelona in the 82 Cup Winners' Cup final on, a, as we say, a neutral venue, but it was Barcelona's home ground and we and they lost there with a, with a free kick. So, um, yeah, that was um, something that was really going great, Belgian club football, and also the national team got uh, benefits of this. And then we played... In a group with uh, Holland, with France, with Ireland and Cyprus, then we had to play qualifying games to reach those 82 uh, final uh, tournament World Cup in, in Spain. Well, H- Holland lost their first game in Ireland, which gave Belgium hopes. And after that, we played one all draw in, in Lansdowne Road. It was uh, for them the first time that Belgium, for the first time in many decades, that Belgium was a favorite against Holland. That was the next game that was to come, the Heysel Stadium 
big open stadium was sold out with 60,000 people. And we beat Holland by goal of uh, Erwin van den Berg, which, uh, which was very important. And then uh, after that, the decisive games uh, were against another big team. That was France. Yeah, we beat France 2-0. In a, in a great game, and then on the same day, Holland drew Ireland, so Belgium got qualified, which was a uh, which absolutely a, a great a great moment in Belgian football because for the first time, as I said, in 12 years, we were back in the final World Cup tournament, and so we were so relaxed, and it didn't matter anymore that we lost the last game, which didn't count anymore, but we lost the last game in Holland three uh, 0 but the basis was set, yeah, with the draw in uh, against uh, Holland and the draw in Ireland, and then. The goals uh, we scored against France that took us to uh, yeah over the, the final uh, let's say the the arrival to to go to to go to Spain and and there we we were successful uh, at least in the first in the first match. How important was the reintegration of the veteran Wilfried Van Moor into the squad? Yeah, this, that was very important. That was already for the 1980 Euros. Uh, Wilfried Van Moor was uh, known as a uh, very, very intelligent uh, player. He was physically strong. Uh, he had uh, two really good feet. He uh, was uh, our best midfield player. In fact, you can say he's the best midfield player in, in Belgian history before the breakthrough of uh, Kevin De Bruyne, of course, who is, is really still much better. But in those days, Wilfi van Moer was just the best, the best you, you could get. Four lungs and two golden feet. He made Sander Leeds the team I mentioned before. He made of them a big team. He suffered as an international player several injuries, so he missed quite a lot of games. He was a guy with a clear view, few words. He was uh, the right man for the team uh, who needed at that moment an experienced player. Although um, Wilfried van Moer, at the moment when he was called up again for the Belgian team, was playing in a smaller side called Beringen. Uh, Bering is a very small team, which then played in first division, then then uh, got relegated, then came back again. And so it was, as we said, an elevator team. And uh, the, the, the season he got called up again for the national team, Beringen was uh, struggling against relegation. And uh, Gites, uh, it, it, it happened on, on, a, on a plane when the national team returned from an uh, international uh, game. And Gites, as always, was sitting next to his good friend, uh, Rick de Sarle, who was... Belgium's most famous TV commentator. And so Rick, who is a football uh, connoisseur and who is uh, also a former player in the 50s of Racing Mechelen, he proposed to Thijs, why don't you ask Wilfried van Moer to come, uh, to come back? And then uh, Thijs said, yes, it may, could be a good idea. He had to ask it three times to Wilfried van Moer before Wilfried um, finally said yes. Uh, he led us uh, to the Euros with victory, as I said, over Portugal and Scotland. And he, he led us also to the silver medal in Rome. It, not only Van Moer reinforced the team, it was only it was not only with it Van Moer, we also had the young players coming up, like Jan Keulemans, who became a real a big star player in Belgium. Erwin van Berg, I mentioned before. Uh, Remo Momos, Eddie Voordekers were all big names in those days. And so thanks to the 1-3 victory in Hampden Park in Scotland, with goals by François van der Els, Belgium, won there and then got qualified for the, for the Euros in 1980. But we were talking about 1982 and Wilfried van Moer was still there, although he played lesser game because he was already two years uh, older, which uh, make, of course, uh, make, of course, a difference in uh, on that age when you have to to fight and play on a, on a very high, uh, high level. Given the progress and the good form of the Belgian clubs that you mentioned in the European competitions... What were the expectations of the public and the press ahead of the World Cup? It was a long time ago we went to a World Cup. People were puzzled also by the great uh, performance the Belgian team had in Italy in the world in the post-1980. So they, they so we that really there was a team again fighting for each other with a good coach uh, that was leading who was leading them. So that was really the, the hopes were very high uh, with the people and definitely with the media. There was also a very good relationship between the media and uh, Guy Thijs, who was always open for uh, any ideas from, from whoever that could be. So he was always listening. In the end, he always um, made his own decisions. But it was a really great atmosphere. And, and it was, yeah, one big family always traveling, uh, press and players uh, together to international uh, matches and, and international tournaments. And, uh, yeah, it was the success was built. And, 
as as the better they they started playing in the qualifying rounds, the the higher the hopes uh, went on to reach something in in a World Cup, and at first to reach the World Cup, and then in the end reaching something during the World Cup. So uh, yeah, the hopes were, were quite high, and well, they got fulfilled. There had been some residual negativity from their last World Cup participation in 1970. Apparently, there had been much disorganization in planning and logistics, and in, there, were, there had been some internal bickering. Yeah. Were concrete efforts made to remedy such problems this time? Well, in 1970, it was uh, in Mexico. It was uh, far away from home. It was uh, hot. Uh, players uh, got homesick because they were not allowed to leave the hotel. They were even not allowed to swim. It was like a, a prison. The, the, the hotel was called Mesol, Meson del Angel in Puebla, but it was not for angels. It, it looked like it was more for prisoners. Uh, and then in 1982, the hotel in Elche in south of Spain, uh, close to Alicante, was really a top location. I, I went there myself 20 years later to make a, a report on the atmosphere in, in the team in 1982. I, I made a kind of a, a retro documentary on, on five crucial moments during that World Cup 82. And I stayed there in the in the marvelous hotel, which is surrounded by a palm tree park called El Palmero in the, in the nice town of uh, Elche. The hotel was built with several cottages. It was a swimming pool. There was a small pub opposite the road. The press was so welcome daily, even part of in the same hotel as the Belgians. So that was really, yeah, and, and also due to Guy Thais, who uh, was uh, more relaxed than, than Remo Hutals was, the atmosphere was, was just fantastic. Ahead of the World Cup, Guy Thais faced a setback. He had planned to include Anderlex Juan Lozano, who still had retained his Spanish citizenship. The Belgian Federation requested the Belgian government to fast track Lozano's citizenship process in time for the World Cup. The Belgian chamber had already passed the request. However, the Senate didn't. And Correct. Lozano's World Cup dream was over. Can yeah. you shed some light on this whole affair? Well, indeed, at that time, Juan Lozano was the best player playing in Belgium. He, had, he was uh, Spanish, but also partly Belgian because he lived in Belgium, never played for the Spanish national team. And of course, that was a player we could we could have integrated in the team. And, and that's why Belgian FA asked the government to, to start this naturalization from the Spanish to the Belgian nationality. Of course, it had to go quick. And uh, some politicians, not all, because as you mentioned before, the chambers passed it. And then the Senate said no. There was one very important vote that was against it. It was uh, Herman van der Poorten. He was uh, also president of, of uh, Lierse. The Leeds Stadium in Belgium is named after him, by the way. He said no, and, and due to his veto, the deal went not on. And so Juan Lozano stayed uh, with the Spanish nationality. What the, the reason why Herman van der Poorten voted against was uh, as a kind of, of reaction to the uh, behavior of, the let's say, the Belgian FA, who thought we are the FA, we can manage this. And he said, well, footballers don't have to think they can get everything uh, whenever they want. So he, he voted more out of principle. He voted no. That was uh, a pity uh, for Belgium, maybe, maybe because uh, Rosano is a very good player. He's uh, technically very skilled. He's uh, inventive. He's, he's an artist. So we, we could have used him, although we played not too bad. It's definitely not in, in, in the first round. But uh, for Rosano, the fact that he didn't get the Belgian nationality or didn't get a, a full Belgian passport, it also had an advantage because thanks to that, he could have uh, his transfer from Anderlecht to Real Madrid. So uh, without that uh, refusion of having the Belgian nationality, he would not never have played for Real Madrid, whereas now he, he played a few years for his, for his dream team and his dream club. So the advantage was for him, but he never played for the national team. That's correct. But he played for Real Madrid. So I think for him, I don't know what the most important was, but I think playing for Real Madrid for a Spanish resident... I think that is maybe more important than playing for the Belgian national team. That's my personal opinion, but I'm not sure. It is correct that, that pictures had to be taken in case the naturalization should be confirmed. And there was also, also the famous Panini sticker. And so they had to take pictures and they put Lozano's pictures already in it. 
And that, of course, upsets some, some politicians. And that might maybe be the, uh, yeah, the decisive reason why they did not vote for a full uh, Belgian citizenship. Let's take a look at the final 22 Belgian players for the World Cup as selected by Gitis. Yeah. Number one, you have Jean-Marie Pfaff of Beveren. Mm-hmm. Number two, captain of the side, Eric Gerets of Standard yeah. Liège. Mm-hmm. Number three, Luke Milkamps of Varagem. Number four, Walter Muse of Standard Liège. Number five, Michel Renken of Anderlecht. Number six, Frank Verkautern of Anderlecht. Number seven, Joseph Darden of Standard Liège. Number eight, Wilfried Van Moor of Beveren. Number nine, Erwin Vandenberg of Liers on his way to Anderlecht for next season. Number 10, Ludo Quek of Anderlecht. Number 11, Jan Sulumans of Club Bruges. Number 12, backup goalkeeper Theo Custers of Espanyol in Barcelona. Mm-hmm. Number 13, Francois van der Rels of Western United in England. Number 14, Mark Bike of Beveren. Number 15, Maurice de Schreiber of Lokeren. Number 16, Gerard Plessers of Standard Liège. Number 17, Rene Verhein of Lokeren. Number 18, Raymond Moments of Lokeren. Number 19, Luke Milkamps' brother, Mark Milkamps of Varagem. Number 20, Guy van der Miesen of Standard Liège. Number 21, Alex Jarniatinski of Antwerp. He was also on yep. his way to Anderlecht for the following season. Yes. And finally, number 22, the third goalkeeper, Jacques Monaron of Anderlecht. And right. we have to mention the original number seven would have been Rene van der Reken of mm-hmm. Genoa in Italy. However, yeah. he was injured in a friendly against Bulgaria on April 28th, and that ruled him out of the World Cup. So Josh Darden was called up as his replacement. Yeah. And just a few names to mention for the preliminary 40-player squad. Some familiar faces. You have Michel Prudhomme of Standard Liège. You have Leo Kleisters of Tonga, as well as Michel De Wolf of Molenbeek. Among some of the players who made a final 40, but not the final 22. Yeah. So a balanced squad all around the set players that Gitis would call upon, except the Van der Reken, of course. Yeah. That was, uh, yeah, his injury was bad. Yeah. So how critical was his loss in terms of tactics, since he was one of the key players? He, w- he was a key player in, uh, let's say, as a, as a defensive midfield player. He was, he was key. He was very smart, very cynical, very slim. He, yeah, well, he was a great player and uh, he, could, he could direct the game in, in, in a certain uh, direction. He was never scared of making a foul when, whenever necessary. So he was, initially on paper, he was replaced by Jos Darden. But in fact, he was replaced by Guy van der Smissen, who was also a midfield player, because there had been some changes in uh, the defense also, because Michel Ranquin didn't have his greatest season. Van Moer, as I said, was getting old. Uh, Walter Mees was injured, so it was not only René van der Eiken. Also, uh, Walter Mees' injury was 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 a, quite a blow. But nevertheless, um, even with those people not being able to play, we had great, uh, great result in, in the first game. Belgium were in Group C at the World Cup based in Elche. Their group opponents were defending champions Argentina, Hungary, and El Salvador. They were immediately under the spotlight as they were to be in the opening match versus Argentina. Ahead of this match, all the talk and headlines would naturally have been about Diego Maradona. How did the group prepare itself ahead of this match? Well, tactically, it was it was uh, biggest issue was uh, how will we defend on Diego Maradona? The, the atmosphere was there. You play as a small nation against the reigning champions. You play in the Now Camp Stadium. It was the opening game of, of the World Cup, and I remember it very well because I had an exam the day after a Spanish uh, grammar, which was uh, a, th- a thick book. I had to study uh, all the way uh, through, and it was so difficult. And I said, "Well." 
whether I will be studying or not, I won't. I won't get uh, half of the points. So uh, let's let's watch the match, and I never regret having watched that uh, historical match where Erwin van den Berg scored the one and only goal that made us so famous and made him also famous. But he Thijs had a, had a good uh, tactical plan. He said we will not put uh, extra men on on Diego Maradona, but we will defend on him in zone. And that worked uh, worked very well. Also, there was a lot of intimidation before the game. When, when both teams arrived, we were, uh, well, Guitaes was not shaking hands, or at least Luis Cesar Menotti, the Argentinian coach, was uh, putting up his nose so when he met the Belgians. He didn't shake hands with Guitaes. He was very hautain. He, he didn't want uh, any eye contact or nothing. So, yes, and, and Guitaes had, had also a great idea to defend on Maradona by, by putting not an extra man I mean, but, but just waiting from him in zone. And that really worked out well. There's an interesting story ahead of this match versus Argentina. Ludo Quick yeah. realized in the dressing room that he had forgotten his playing boots back in their hotel. That's Do you correct. know if this story yeah. is accurate? The story is accurate, yes. I was not I was not at the World Cup because I was too young then. I was just uh, started working as a radio correspondent. I was watching the game, I was following that World Cup from home, but I read the story and afterwards when I made the report on, on the 20 years documentary of, of the World Cup in 1982, I made the documentary 20 years later. And then that story was told also that Ludo Cook really forgot his boots and uh, someone, I don't think he traveled with them, someone went to, to get it in the hotel and he had his uh, boots on time. Let's go and look at this match on June 13th, 1982 at Barcelona's new camp, the opening World Cup match between Belgium and Argentina. For Belgium, we have the following squad. Jean-Marc Pfaff, captain of the side Eric Gerrits, Luke Milkamps, Mark Baik, Maurice De Schreiber, Ludo Quek, Frank Verkautern, Guy van der Miesen, Erwin Vandenberg, Alex Jornatinsky, and Jan Sulemans. For Argentina, managed by Cesar Luis Menotti, you have the following squad. Ubaldo Filol of River Plate, Jorge Olguin of Independiente, Luis Galvan of Talleres de Cordoba, captain of the side Daniel Passarella of River Plate, Alberto Tarantini of River Plate, Osvaldo Ardiles of Tottenham in England, Diego Maradona of Boca Juniors, Americo Gallego of River Plate, Daniel Bertoni of Fiorentina in Italy, Ramon Diaz of River Plate, He'd be replaced by Jorge Valdano of Real Zaragoza in Spain in the 64th minute and Mario Kempes of River Plate. We've seen the highlights of this match from the left side. Verkautern sends it across. Vandenberg controls it and struck a shot past Philol. This was a surprise win for the Belgians. It was also the first opening match maybe since maybe in 20 years that I had actually produced a goal. That was also yes. something that was, uh, that was mentioned at the time. Mm-hmm. But it was a good start for the Belgians. And already you could say their World Cup had been somewhat of a success just because of this win. That's correct. That was uh, when, when we remember the 1982 World Cup. There is one moment that everyone will always be remember. It's one of those iconic moments in, in football history. That is Erwin van den Berg's goal against uh, Argentina. That is, uh, I went to Erwin, with Erwin van den Berg in the documentary 20 years later. I walked on the pitch of Camp Nou where he was uh, reenacting his uh, 1982 goal, telling what he felt, uh, the doubts he had, uh, what should he do? Should he lop? Should he pass the goalkeeper? Because Filiol came out and then he, yeah, he tried his best. He, he scored and the, 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 TV commentator went completely mad. He was commentating like a South American uh, commentator. He was shouting, goal, goal, the Erwin van den Berg. Like, the only can do is uh, do it in South America. So it was a South American uh, atmosphere in the Belgian, uh, Belgian living rooms by listening to that commentator. But it was an absolute historic moment. There have been a few others uh, of we will be, which we will be discussing uh, uh, within a few moments. But that was from day one. It was uh, yeah, a big statement by Belgium that, uh, yes, we can beat, we were able to beat the big uh, Argentinian uh, world champions and we beat them uh, our own way. We had chances. We also had good defending, good goalkeeping by Jean-Marie Favre, who really made some great saves. So it's thanks to the 
the coolness of uh, Erwin van den Berg and the great saves by goalkeeper Jean-Marie Pfaff that we were able to beat Argentina in this opening match. Belgium's next match was on June 19th at Elche versus El Salvador. And let's remind ourselves that El Salvador had lost their opening match 10-1 to to Hungary. For this match, we have the following lineup for Belgium. Jean-Marc Pfaff, Cap Novicide Eric Gerets, Luke Milkamps, Mark Baik, Walter Muse, Ludo Quek, Frank Verkautern, Guy van der Miesen. He'd replaced by Francois van der Elst in the 46th minute. Erwin Vandenberg, Alex Jarniatinski, Jan Sulumans, and he'd be replaced by Wilfred Van Moor in the 79th minute. Belgium won by a single goal. It was a beautiful long range effort from Ludo Quek. Yeah, it is uh, because uh, El Salvador was playing very defensively. They wanted to uh, avoid another uh, humiliating uh, game. So they were defending, defending, and, and even Belgian who were technically quite well, but was more a character team, had really difficulties to get through that defense. And then the big, uh, the biggest weapon of Ludo Cook was his strike from, from distance. That was his, his strongest, uh, strongest weapon. That was his, his biggest quality. He was a very good player, very styleful uh, player with a good passing also. But his strike was phenomenal. And uh, thanks to this strike, we managed to beat uh, El Salvador. So yes, that was uh, absolutely necessary. Everything on the field seemed to be going on the right direction. However, there were problems off the field. Let's discuss the situation with Belgium's goalkeeper, Jean-Marie Pfaff. His behavior during the World Cup would eventually be to the detriment of the team and his chances in the second round. Let's take a look at some of his antics. In one incident, he had called the police after he had seen someone enter teammate René Verheyen's room. In the end, it turned out to be Verheyen's wife. In another incident, during a team get-together with the media at their hotel, a radio commentator pushed Pfaff in the pool as a prank. Pfaff panicked as apparently he couldn't swim. Did the pressure get to Pfaff or was this just his personality? Uh, it was a bit both. Dominic Pfaff could not swim, that's correct. But all players were in or around the swimming pool. And I saw that swimming pool myself. It was a great, fine, uh, very good located swimming pool. And there were a few photographers in the hotel. And they asked, well, Jean-Marie, just for the picture, can you go into the water? Then he knew he could not swim. So he stayed only in the undeep part of the pool. And that's just on behalf of of the photographers. So as I said, the press was was mainly in the same hotel as uh, the players and they were also very welcome if they were not staying in, in the hotel. And then Jean-Marie went, went more into the deep and there uh, there was the, the late Jan Wouters, the biggest radio commentator in, in Belgian uh, history. And Jean-Marie Pfaff just put the radio reporters, he pushed him on his head and Jan Wouters, the, the, the radio reporter, was not aware that Jean-Marie could not swim and he reacted and then Jean-Marie Pfaff nearly went, well, he, then he went with his head into the water and the radio reporter thought he was making a joke, but he wasn't making a joke. He really could not swim. And so they had to take him out and it was a whole fuss. And then Jean-Marie always is he's always adding something extra because that's his personality. He likes attention and he likes sometimes to be not part of the team, but just outside the team. He, he's not, the, well, he, he was not everyone's friend. He was everyone's friend from the fans, but he was not everyone's friend within the team. And so the day itself, in the afternoon, he was not feeling well. He was having a headache and the the, the player that stayed with him in the room came down to the doctor and said, Doctor, you have to come and and see Jean-Marie. He's not okay, absolutely not. He doesn't want to come to have lunch with the other players. So the doctor went with the team manager. They went up to his room and they said, Jean-Marie, what's, what's going on? Well, I'm sick. I'm a headache. I cannot come and have lunch. Well, uh, the doctor said there's only two possibilities. You have some soup, and then you, you, can, you can get better. If not, you, can, you, you better come and have some soup with the other players, and then you will get better soon. If you don't do that, then you should have to go to the hospital to have a checkup, but that could take one day, and you will miss next game. 
Five minutes later, he was sitting on the table with the other. <laughs> so that was that was uh, typical Jean Marie. Jean Marie. Fall. There were other incidents which you will uh, like to talk on. We can do that when, whenever you like. But yes. the, the swimming pool uh, incident, yes, that was correct. But you mentioned on on Jean Marie talking to someone that uh, Rene Verein's wife came in. That's a story I, I'm not familiar with. Most of the players' wives stayed home, as far as I remember. There has been an incident on uh, an article in the Belgian paper that, that was, in fact, a follow-up of a story in a Spanish paper. So the Spanish paper reported that Belgian players went out with uh, other women and they had uh, they drank beer. And just to make a bit a fool of it, one of the Belgian journalists made, a, as we say, a satire a column of it. He, he laughed with it and, and he made the story even worse than it than it was. It, there, in fact, there was nothing, but just to show that the story was really nothing, he made it up as it was a big fuss. And then the problem was the title of the piece was Whiskey y Amor. That was the title of the piece, but it was pure humor. The only problem is that the wives of the players who stayed in Belgium and who read that story in the Belgian newspaper, yeah, they didn't have this feeling for humor, so they did not understand really the main point that the journalist wanted to make that was making a fool out of the Spanish media rather than from the players because he was behind the players. And it was all taken wrongly on in, in, in Belgium, so there has been, yeah, they had to calm down a bit and and there was then a period that that, uh, that was just to go only or it lasted just one day that the Belgian players were not willing to speak to, to the Belgian press because of hate. also they took it very bad. But in the end, it was a storm in a teacup. On June 22nd at Elche, Belgium taken on Hungary. You have the following lineup. Jean-Marie Pfaff, Eric Gerets, captain of the side. He replaced by Gerard Plessers in the 62nd minute. Luke Milkamps, Mark Bike. Walter Muse, Ludo Quek, Frank Verkautern, Guy van der Miesen. He'd be replaced by Wilfried van Moor in the 46th minute, Erwin Vandenberg, Alex Jarniatinski, and Jan Sulemans. And going through the Hungary lineup managed by Kalman Majoli, you have Ferenc Majaros of Sporting Club in Portugal, Giozo Martos of Vatershai in Belgium, Attila Kerekes of Bekespayai, Imr Garabay of uh, Honved, Sandor Müller of Hercules in Spain. He replaced by Sandor Salai of Debreceni in the 67th minute. Captain of the side, Tibor Nilashi of Ferenc Varos, Lajlo Fizikas of Antwerp in Belgium, Andras Torochik of Uchpest, Joseph Varga of Honved, Lajlo Kish of Vasas. He replaced by Ferenc Zongradi of Videotone in the 70th minute, and Gabor Poloskai of Ferenc Varos. So in this match, Hungary would take the lead in the first half by Joseph Varga. Belgium would have to at least get a tie to advance to the next round. Yes. They pressed on, and in the second half, Alex Jernatinsky in the 76th minute tied the match, and that allowed Belgium to win the group and qualify to the next round. They had been one of the surprise teams of this World Cup. We have to go back to Jean-Marie Pfaff again. Yeah. During this match, I guess the previous day's incidents may have gotten to him. In the 55th minute of the match, he came to intercept a cross destined for Hungary's Torochik. But he did it with such a ferocity that he struck his teammate, Eric Gerets, who was injured in the process. And that's why he was replaced. Later on, also, he nearly injured Fazekas in a rushing out in a similar attempt. But more was to follow afterwards. An ambulance had been called to take Gerets to the hospital. The ambulance arrived. Faf got in there first because of a doubtful shoulder injury. Garrett was forced to stay behind. This behavior enraged Tease, and Tease took the drastic decision to drop Faf for the rest of the World Cup. The official reason given was because of Faf's alleged indiscipline and childish behavior in pretending to drown in the hotel swimming pool. 
Belgian Federation official uh, Mr. Ruter described Faf as an immature child who only sought publicity. The story you told is uh, not for the 100% uh, correct, but uh, also in the documentary I made uh, 20 years later, I talked with Jean-Marie Faf on Elche's pitch, uh, what really happened. There was a big cross coming up and Eric Gerritz was running backwards as a right back. He was running backwards to the goalkeeper, trying to intercept that high cross. At the same time, Jean-Marie Faf was coming out of the goal to have the ball also. They clashed. And Eric Gerrits went uh, dizzy, went completely down. And Jean-Marie Pfaff had a kind of luxation in his shoulder. He really was injured. Absolutely. That's correct. What is not correct is that Eric Gerrits, he did not stay behind. He took the ambulance that was ready for him. But also Jean-Marie Pfaff took the ambulance. So they both went to hospital in an ambulance that was just foreseen for Eric Gerrits because he was really uh, dizzy. He had to be taken off the field because uh, he, he could not play anymore. And they, the, the doctor said uh, Eric Gerrits did not want to, to leave the pitch. When the doctor and the physio went to take Gerrits off, he punched them. When he was realizing that they were taking him in to the sideline, he punched them and, and ran back on it. And then the doctor said to the referee, please, Tell him he has to stop. He has to go to the hospital. At that time, it was quite dangerous. So in the end, Gerrits was taken to uh, the ambulance. Jean-Marie Pfaff was already there with his uh, hurt uh, shoulder. They drove to the hotel where Eric Gerrits uh, stayed and where Jean-Marie Pfaff was very popular among the uh, hospital staff by uh, distributing uh, autographs. And that was really that the Belgium FA could not appreciate his behavior there. But Eric Gerrits... There were no echoes at those times, so he had to be uh, woke, waken up and, and controlled uh, every hour because he had a very uh, severe concussion. In the end, Gites was not amused and, and called up uh, for the other game, uh, Theo Kusters, telling the people uh, and, and, and telling that, or yeah, maybe saying that it was uh, due to his behavior. But in the end, Jean-Marie Pfaff, well, it was not so. It, people thought it was for his behavior which could have been the reason. But in the end, Jean-Marie Pfaff wasn't physically able to play the other game. So he really was injured. But also, maybe if he was not that bad injured, Gites maybe had to take, uh, had let him off of the pitch and had to uh, come on um, Theo Kusters. What is correct, that, that was that Jean-Marie Pfaff was, was really injured and was not able to play. But his, his behavior there was, uh, yeah, was not accepted by most of his uh, teammates and certainly not by the... Uh, Belgian FA uh, leading people, nor uh, Coach Gites. That's uh, that's correct. But the, the the very moment, it's one of those the clash between Gerrits and and Faf is one of those five moments that we all remember from that World Cup, together with the Edwin van den Berg's goal against Argentina, the swimming pool incident. Well, then the other remarkable uh, moment we all know is the way the equalizer was being produced by a rush of Jan Keulemans. Who, he took the whole right right wing and he ran, he ran, he, he struggled, he fell, he stood up again, he ran. And then he gave a cross to, to Alex Czernatinsky who, who didn't kick the ball in. He was running with the ball in the goal. So he, undeliberately he, he got the, the ball onto his foot and that was the way the, the ball went, went over the line and the Belgian scored the equalizer. So that was a real magic moment of, those, uh, of that World Cup. Uh, 82, the rush of Jan Keulemans on the right wing in Elche. And then, of course, the clash, Pfaff and Gerrits. And then there is one more to come, because after that, Gites took uh, Theo Kusters in goal for the second round. And, uh, yeah, Theo Kusters didn't play his best game against uh, Poland, where he got beaten by a fabulous uh, Zbigniew Boniek, the uh, Polish uh, star player. And Theo Kusters made a big mistake by the first goal and didn't look very well at the second either. But, uh, yeah... Faf was injured. He could not play. In my research, I read a lot of the stories about Faf. So it just shows that you can't believe everything you read because there are so many reports similar to that that mm -hmm. I read over the years. Yeah, it is. It was a great goalkeeper, but he was a showman also. Yeah. 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 Belgium had qualified to the second round as group winners and they were to play their matches at Barcelona's Camp Nou. The authorities attempted to switch the venues and move Poland, Belgium, and USSR to Saria and move Brazil, Argentina, and Italy to Camp Nou for better receipts. However, the Belgian Federation president, Louis Vouchers, threatened that 
if they were forced to play at Saria, would wear black armbands as a sign of protest. How serious were the organizers in making this switch? I don't know how serious they were because the but the, the way the Belgian president then Louis Wouters acted uh, made you think it was very, very, very serious. So and I can imagine that the organizers said, oh, no, my God, we will have Belgian playing Poland for a half full uh, camp now. And we will have extra people uh, waiting in, in queues to come to Saria and see Argentina playing Brazil or Italy. So I understand that was in their mind, but our president at the time, he said, no, we can't talk about it. It's no discussion. We are group winners. We will play in, in our camp. If not, it was not only uh, we were not only playing with black uh, armbands, we will play black socks, black shorts, black shirts. That's the way he, he told it in the radio interview. I still remember as if it was yesterday. So he was very, very angry. In the end, I don't remember exactly what made the organizers change their minds. But in the end, Belgium played in the now camp and Argentina and uh, Italy and Brazil played in the small Nasaria Stadium of Espanyol with only half the capacity of, of the camp now. Belgium faced Poland in the second round at Camp Nou on June 28th. As we mentioned, Faf was out. So you have the following lineup. Theo Custers in goal, Michel Rankin, Walter Muse, Luke Milkamps, Gerard Plessers, and also New Garrett as well. So the defense is already weakened. So Gerard Plessers, he replaced by Mark Bike in the 88th minute. Captain of the side in Gerrits' absence, Wilfred Van Moer. And he'd be replaced by Francois Van der Elst in the 46th minute. Ludo Quek, Frank Verkautern, Jan Sulemans, Erwin Vandenberg, and Alex Jerniatinski. And we should mention that Poland's Lato was making his 100th international appearance in this match. Yeah. So for Poland, managed by Antoni Pieknicek, we have the following lineup. Joseph Mlinarzik of Vizolodz, Pavel Janas of Legio Warsaw, Marek Zuba of LKS Lodz, captain of the side Vladislav Zamuda of Vizolodz, Stefan Majewski of Legio Warsaw, Valdemar Matizik of Gornik Zabrze, Janusz Kupchevich of Arka Gdynia, he'd be replaced by Vlodzmir Czolek of Stal Mielek in the 82nd minute, Andrzej Bunkol of Legio Warsaw, Gersgors Lato of Lokeren in Belgium, Zbigniew Boniek of Vizio Lodz, and Vlodzmir Smolarek of Vizio Lodz. We mentioned this would be a one-man show by Zbigniew Boniek, who would score a hat-trick. The first one is very memorable with Lato on the right side, passing across at the edge of the box, and Boniek just blasting it to the roof of the net. He would also score a header in the 25th minute, lobbying over Custers. For the third one in the 54th minute, Lato just split the Belgian defense and Bonnik went through around Custers to score past him. It seemed like the absences of Faf and Gerrits had cost Belgium this match in some way. Yeah, yeah, you can say that. As, as I mentioned before, Custers did not uh, play his, his best game. And Faf was a miraculous goalkeeper with uh, great saves. He was a showman, as I told you, but he was uh, the best goalkeeper at those times in Belgian history. And even in the world, uh, he has been elected in Mexico uh, four years later as best goalkeeper of the world. So we missed uh, Jean-Marie Faf and also Eric Gerrits, because as I mentioned, Michel Ranquin was not in his best season at the, with his club. Gerard Plessis was a substitute. Yeah, it wasn't that easy. And Boniek was exceptional that night. So we were chanceless against the Polish stars. We didn't have any stars that evening. Belgium had one more match on July 1st. Again, at Camp Nou, they faced the Soviet Union. For this match, like you mentioned earlier, Sis dropped Custers after his poor match against Poland. And he was replaced by Jack Monaron in the starting yep. lineup. So Belgium employed all their three goalkeepers during this World Cup. So you have this side, Monaron, Michel mm -hmm. Rankin, Luke Milkamps, captain this time, Walter Muse, Maurice de Shriver, and again, uh, Gareth was still out. So yeah. Maurice de Shriver, and he replaced by Mark Milkamps in the 65th minute. Rene Verheyen 
Guy van der Miesen, he replaced by Alex Jerniatinski in the 58th minute. Ludo Quek, Frank Verkautern, Jan Sulemans, and Erwin Vandenberg. Going through the Soviet Union lineup managed by Konstantin Beskov, you have Rinat Dasayev of Spartak Moscow in goal. Captain of the side, Alexander Chivadze of Dynamo Tbilisi. Sergei Baltacha of Dynamo Kiev. Sergei Borovsky of Dynamo Minsk. Anatoly Demyanenko of Dynamo Kiev. Vladimir Besonov of Dynamo Kiev. Andri Bal of Dynamo Kiev. He replaced by Vitali Daraselia of Dynamo Tbilisi in the 87th minute. Yuri Gavrilov of Spartak Moscow. Ramaz Shengelia of Dynamo Tbilisi. He replaced by Sergei Rodionov of Spartak Moscow in the 89th minute. Horan Oganesian of Ararat Yerevan. And Oleg Bluchin of Dynamo Kiev. The Soviet Union would win this match 1-0. Oganesian scoring in the 46th minute after he volleyed Gavrilov's cross from the left side. To be very honest, from that game, that's the game I remember the least of. I think also for the Belgian people, I hope the World Cup was over after the 3 0 uh, defeat against Poland. We were not aiming that we could beat Soviet Union by uh, a great scoreline. Uh, Soviet Union, as you mentioned, all the players, it's players from Russia, from Ukraine, from Georgia. It's, uh, it was such a strong team and such a big pool, as you can say, of which you could take players out. So that was uh, an amazing, an amazing side. So big, so strong. And uh, well, the, the hopes were on a very low and the, the mood was not well after the 3-0 defeat against Poland. So And everyone was, was still relying and, and enjoying the, yeah, the big win against uh, Argentina. That made Belgium's World Cup uh, to a success. Uh, rather than the the three nil against Poland, what we what we all uh, retain of the World Cup is, as I mentioned before, is the Edwin van der Berg's goal against Argentina. That win is one of the most iconic moments in Belgium history. If you talk about World Cup Spain '82, Edwin van der Berg against Argentina, also Jan Keulemans against Hungary with his rush, and all the rest. And then you say there's in the third place, you can say okay, the the the, the fact we were beaten three nil against Poland, but we we retain. In that order, gold for Erin van der Meris goal against Argentina, silver for Jan Keulemans, and then bronze for uh, Theo Kustus in a very bad way. But he was, he's a great guy. He's a great goalkeeper, but he made a few mistakes in that game that were crucial and that were ending our hopes of, of going through. I had a question about Faf's reintegration because with everything that I read, given his antics, I was somewhat surprised why just immediately after the World Cup, he was back in favor. But as you said, he seemed to really have been injured. He was injured, absolutely. I spoke not earlier than yesterday. I spoke with a doctor of those times because I wanted to fresh up some things. And he said, yeah, Jamal Ifaf, he was injured. He was not as much injured as he told. But the doctor said he was not fit to play. That's absolutely correct. So he was injured, absolutely. Which players do you think capitalized from this World Cup and which ones maybe came out looking worse? Well, the one who capitalized the most was Erwin van den Berg. He, he had a transfer to France, to Lille, which is a town just across the border. He uh, was one of the first Belgian players going abroad. And then Jan Keulemans said that was from AC Milan. But he was such a family guy that he didn't want to leave Belgium. And so he preferred to stay in Belgium rather to go to AC Milan. Times have changed. In those days, players played in good teams in Belgium. Belgium was a top country in European football. The, the clubs did well. Okay, they were not as much paid as, as in Italy or Spain. But uh, they had a good life here and, and they didn't want to leave. And even Erwin van den Berg took a team just across the border so that he could stay living in Belgium and just going uh, for work outside. And the one who was maybe the one who was less popular, as I mentioned, was probably Theo Kustus because of his, his fouls against Poland. But the ones who benefited the most was, I think, Erwin van den Berg and, and Jan Keulemans. Yeah. We can't discuss Belgium without mentioning those Admiral kits, yeah. whether mm-hmm. in red or white. Or yeah. they did not use the white in this World Cup. This design has become a classic. How do nostalgic fans or kit fans view this particular kit? 
Well, we have several uh, we have several kits, of course, that are quite famous. Also, our recent kits are are famous. But those Admiral kits uh, were one of the yeah, were special. And I, I I can see now you have also kits of the of the Diadora brand in, in the nineties. But those Admiral kits of of the eighties, yeah, it was. Admiral was British. It was good in the market. People loved British football, loved the British style. And so they also loved the British style kits. So that was maybe one of the most popular, also due to the fact that we played a great, two, well, a great first round thanks to these kits. Historically, what is the legacy of this World Cup for Belgian football? Well, historically, it was, it was as I said, the first World Cup in, in 12 years. And it was the first of six in a row. And so we played the World Cup of 1982, we played the World Cup of 1986, of 1990, of 1994, of 1998, and of 2002. So that was six World Cups in succession for Belgium after a period with hardly a big tournament. That was a very, very big success. And it all started, yeah, you can say it started during the Euros in Italy, okay. But as we are talking on World Cups, for the next six years, was always there. On the contrary, they were not taking part in any European championship. We missed the the uh, eighty uh, the eighty four championships in no. France. We were there, but we didn't play it very well. We we lost five 0 against France in Nantes. We were not there in eighty eight in Germany. We were not there in ninety two in Denmark. We were not there in ninety six in England, and we were in in our own country for the Euro 2000. So, uh, and then we were not there in 2004, not in 2008, not in 2012. So for the Euros, we've always had difficulties. And for the World Cup, six times in succession, it's it's uh, unexplicable, but it, it's, it's that. So the legacy of the World Cup uh, in Spain was that it was the first of a, of a row. And that, as I mentioned, the iconic moments like uh, the, the win against Argentina, well, Erwin van den Berg and the picture of Belgium beating Argentina in a, in a packed uh, Camp Nou, that's the legacy. Thank you for taking us back 40 years. And it's unbelievable that it's, this is the 40th anniversary of that World Cup. It is, so, yeah. Thank you once again. And, uh, Welcome. Well, and hopefully in the future, we'll discuss the 1984 adventure. Not yeah. as pleasant, but still a lot to discuss. Yeah. Okay. So once again, we'd like to thank Mr. Van Luuk for his participation in this interview. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. You may contact me on my blog and on Facebook. I'm under Soccer Nostalgia. On Twitter, I'm at SP1873. To contact Mr. Paul Whittle, you can contact him at on Twitter at 1888letter. And his blog is the 1888 letter. You may also follow the podcast on Spotify and now on Acast, Google, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts, all under Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. Please leave a review, rate, and subscribe if you like the podcast. Mr. Von Luke's contact info is on Twitter. He's at Stefan underscore Von Luke. And I've also included the links for his website as well as links on Amazon for his books. Again, all this information is listed on the blog and Spotify listings. So, Mr. Van Luuk, thank you once again. And Thanks, hope Sham. To see you again in the future. You're welcome. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Nice Bye. to meet you. Nice to talk to you. Bye-bye. Same here. Bye.